Morning. Uh, I'm Tim, like Billy said. I love being in this house. Um, we did meet Tyler and Ashley in 2007 when we moved to Waco, Texas to join Antioch and jump into the discipleship school. Um, God had called us to be overseas while we were living in Atlanta. Um, being the, my wife and I, we were college pastoring at a church there. <coughs> and we encountered Antioch. And so I'm not gonna tell you a whole lot of that story, but we got to go through the training school days with Tyler and Ashley. Um, it was a joy to get to know them and it has connected us to your, to your church since that time. My family, I think, Jonathan, we've got a picture of my family. That's our family. We lived in Kurdistan in Northern Iraq for about 12 years. We came back in 2020. We got to go back and visit this summer for the first time after a couple years being back in the States. And um, so Annie on the right, me with the gray hair in the middle, Toby in the middle there that he, Annie's 20 uh, in her third year of college. Toby is about to start college. He's 18. Christy, my beautiful wife, and our youngest, Jesse, who will be a senior in high school this year. So that's our family. So thankful for them. The kids came up even this morning from Waco down. I don't know which direction we are. I'm not good at directions. And um, <clears throat> so fun to have my family here with me to feel like we're in a house that, that um, we have a deep relationship with, with this house. And uh, I'm just so excited for what the Lord has to speak to us this morning. Um, I'm so honored to be asked to be a part of this with you. And uh, I just wanna pray one more time real quick as we get going. God, we honor you. We are here um, to honor you. We're here for you, Lord Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that as, um, as you move and do your work uh, in this room this morning, that you would uh, speak into every place of need, that you, would, uh, that you would lift up the glory of God today in our hearts, that you would elevate the greatness of Jesus in our hearts and minds, in our eyes and in our ears. Uh, that you would do your work of glorifying the Son and glorifying the Father, uh, because that's our goal this morning. Uh, as we look at your word and we talk about who you are, uh, God, would you be honored in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so as uh, we jump, as you all have been in this series, I think this is week six of an amazing series looking at the character of God, and we are continuing that. Uh, I just want to recap a little bit of what you've been through and why we're doing this. Um, the purpose of this series is to make God known for who he is. The purpose is not to give you our thoughts on who we think God is. That's how cults start. When we depart from what this says and we start to come to what, what our, in, our thoughts are on what this says, we're, we're starting to get into troublesome ground. The words in this book matter. They matter. God, God ordained the words in this book. He inspired them through the Holy Spirit, through men, to write them down, and they are inerrant in every way. And so we should treat them as such and believe that we have the, the, the general revelation of God is entirely in this book. Now, does the Holy Spirit still work today to give special revelation? Absolutely, he does. But this revelation is good for all men, for all time. There's nothing in it that needs to change. There's nothing in it that will change. And so we can lean into and depend on this word for everything that we need to know. This is what is true to us. And this sermon series is about elevating the character of God based on who he is and what he is like. 
our response to that, to seeing God for who he really is, should be awe and wonder. It should be humility and meekness. It should be love and affection toward this God who is so separate and holy and and different, but has revealed himself to us to be near him and to be relational with him and intimate with him. So we, we should respond in such a way that draws us more to him because that's how he's revealed himself. The men of God of this house have brought the word of God to this house so that the God of this house would be lifted high. That's why we stand here to present not great thoughts that we have, to present a great God in this place. And, and that's what we're gonna do this morning. So week one, God is sovereign. He's over all things. He's powerful and strong and able to handle everything. Week two, God is holy. He is separate and different and unique in all of the universe. Week three, God is faithful. He will do what he says he will do. He will stay and never depart. Week four, God is patient. He is patient in a way that we don't even understand, that we can't comprehend, that he's waiting that all men would come to repentance. Week four, God, week five, God is generous. If you've walked with God for any amount of time, you know his generosity toward you. He is a giving God all the time, giving from himself, not to mention the ultimate gift of his son, Jesus. And Jesus, the ultimate gift of him laying his own life down. So today, week six, we're gonna talk about this, another incredible attribute of God. God is love. And I am delighted to get to share this with you. Who is God as the God of love? God is love. Now, I wanna share with you something that, I looked, I have this book that my pastor gave me in 1998 when I, when I was in college. He gave me a copy of the book, The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. And I want to commend this book to you because as we're, as we're about to wrap up next week, I think, is that right? We're wrapping up this series on the attributes of God. Can I commend to you to read this book, The Knowledge of the Holy? It is 12 or 15 short chapters on the attributes of God, on why is it, it, it is important to understand God for who he revealed himself to be and nothing but that. So Tozer says in chapter one, right at the beginning, he says, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. Why is it important to understand God for who he says he is? Because Tozer also says the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. And I would like to submit to you that in our day, and probably in every day, but it is true today, we have many unworthy thoughts of God. Idolatry is not just worshiping something that is other than God. Idolatry is believing things about God and entertaining things about God that are not true of him, that are unworthy of who he is. It is right for us to desire to know how has God revealed himself and how does that impact my relationship with him, my understanding of him. It is critical for us to know what God says of himself. Because when we know what he says of himself, we can tell who he is and what he's like. And in that, we can have a right understanding of life and of goodness and love and his sovereignty, his power, his holiness, his faithfulness. 
it's critical for us to have right thoughts about God. Now, let me tell you my favorite Tozer quote. And when you're talking about the different parts of who God is, or different attributes of what he's like, Tozer says beautifully, all of God does all that God does. Let me say that again. All of God does all that God does. So whenever he acts like this, his mercy is acting like that. His justice, his love, his kindness, his goodness, all of him is acting in that one direction. He is never acting in part because there are no parts to God. God is whole. He's unified. He is never uncertain about anything that he does. And that means as you've been learning about what his word says about him, you can be confident that when you're, when you're thinking about God acting toward you in a just way, he's also acting in a loving way. When he's needing to discipline you, he's also acting in mercy and love and kindness and goodness. When you are crying out because you see a wrong in the world and injustice in the world, you can be certain that not only will his justice be acting in that direction, but his goodness, his kindness, his love, his gentleness, all of God does all that God does. The unity of God is profound and it is good for us to see him in wholeness and unity because when we read the Old Testament, we often think, well, that's a different version of God than I see in Jesus in the New Testament. And I just wanna tell you, that's not a different God. We just have to learn to understand and see him the way he revealed himself. If we think he's different, it is a misunderstanding on our part, not on his part, right? Because God is unified in his character and in his attributes in every way. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are unified in every way imaginable and beyond what we can imagine because there's much about God we have no ability to even begin to imagine. He's beyond our imagination, except what he has revealed to us to, to know about him. And that's all right here. There will never be a, a new revelation of the spirit to the people of God that is for everyone on the planet. All general revelation that God has decided to reveal in scripture, Jesus said, this is it. It's all right here. There are plenty of revelations that are important for you in the moment because God says the word is alive and active and it cuts us to the very deepest part of us, right? That's a special revelation from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit and through the word of God. But we can know God as fully as he has revealed himself. This is not all of who God is. God cannot be summed up in a book. He can't, but this is what he has revealed to us as the revelation of God for now. All scripture, it is inspired by God and profitable to us for all the things that Timothy said, Paul said to Timothy. Okay, so that's what we're about. We are about seeing God in unity. We are about seeing that all of God does everything that God does. So I've got a couple questions and I want you to answer. These are not rhetorical questions. I would love to interact with us for just a little bit together. We're talking about God is love. So right now, not a response. You can put your hand up. Who here wants to be loved? I do. I hope that everyone has an immediate yes in their heart. If you don't, then you're in the right place today because you should hear that God loves you today. Because I have two goals. I have two things that God asked me to do to tell you. Number one is that God loves you. And I'm gonna tell you over and over, God loves you. And we're gonna try to get to what does that mean? But today is not about you. Today is about God. And, and a lot of times when we preach, we wanna give an application and there will be a response at the end. But this is about us seeing who God is because when we see him rightly, it has an impact on us. So today is primarily not about you or us. It's about him 
and, and trying to see him rightly as, as love. So we all want to be loved. Who here wants to be loving? I want to be loving. And we're going to learn a lot about what it looks like to be loving today because we're going to see who God is. And so then my question is, um, we're going to get to that question in a minute. Sorry. So when I tell you that God loves you, somehow that, that makes sense. There's a part of that that feels like, okay, I know what that means. God loves me. We know it's good. We know we want it to be true. And yet, I would say, if I look you in the face and say, God loves you, that there's a part of you that, that is ready to receive that. And there's also a part of you that starts to make excuses. Something, something pushes back sometimes. Something says, there's no way that can be true. Your history and your story might begin to remember your failures, remember where you haven't been the way God has asked, Remember the bad decisions that you've made, the people that you've hurt, the way you've been hurt, the way you feel broken. And we start to believe that those things are bigger than God's ability to love us. And I wanna challenge that today by showing you how big God's love is, by showing you who he is when the Bible says God is love. So let's, let's try to define love. So here's my first question to you. What is not love that, that sometimes is called love? So you can, you can answer. What is something that's not love or not quite love, but might be said to be love? Lust. Good. Sorry. Obsession. Very good. Sex. Codependency. Thank you. From this side, we've got an answer. You guys are doing great. <laughs> Materialism. Infatuation. Infatuation. Acceptance. Acceptance. Very good. Control. Control. One or two more. Kindness. Kindness. A form of love, but not love itself. Convenience. Convenience. Okay. Those are, this is why I love to hear from people because in a room like this, God is gonna reveal things through a lot of different people in a moment. So here are some things that I wrote down. Love is not feelings. Feelings are a part of love, but love is not a feeling. Love is not agreement with somebody. Our culture tells you that you have to agree with people to, be, to love them. That is a lie. Amen. It's a lie. Just being nice. Is that what love is? So I have about 18 years of vocational ministry. And now for the last year, I've been, uh, I'm the COO of a company. It's a small company. That's a big title. I really don't know what I'm doing half the time. <laughs> but I'm a very pastoral person. So I came into this role and I'm going to pastor everybody. And a few months in, I lost one of my main employees and she basically said, you always wanted to know how I feel about everything, but you didn't help me do my job. <laughs> right? And just, just on Friday, I had a very tense conversation by the Slack. It's a messaging system that we use with one of my employees. Her name is Cindy and she's She's a little prickly as a person, and so it's hard for me sometimes, but we asked her to do something, and she was just, you know, excuse after excuse, and I'm sitting, and I'm like, I've written, I've written her a message like 10 times and deleted it, and I'm wrestling, and I'm like, God, I don't know what to say, and I'm, I'm preparing for this sermon on God is love, and I'm like, this is not what it looks like for God to be love, and he just says, basically, it is loving to expect her to do what you have asked her to do because it's her job and it's your job to communicate that in a nice way. And 
just being nice is not loving. And I, I'm a nine on the Enneagram, if you know the Enneagram, so I just want to be nice to everybody all the time. And I'm in a job where I'm, in, I'm directing a lot of people, and I can't be nice all the time. And Pastor Tim has had to take a back seat to Executive Tim, and I don't really know what to do about that sometimes. But I'm learning that, that being direct and directive is loving and pastoral and it's right. But just being nice, not that loving a lot of the time. Self-fulfillment, that is not love. Self-actualization, basically anything that starts with self, we're gonna find out that's really not love. <laughs> um, desire and passion, we had some comments about that. Love is not temporary. It does not change. I love ice cream. Is that love? It's really not. So we have, you know, in, in English and in every language, we borrow powerful words. The word awesome, I love to use the word awesome. It used to mean God. God is awesome. There's nothing else that's awesome. It doesn't mean that anymore. I love to, I say that's awesome all the time. But we, we, use the word love to say many things, but we wanna see how God defines love. So I asked my, some of my family members, uh, what is love? And we got some responses from them, and then I'd love to hear a couple of yours. My nieces and nephews, maybe eight to 16 or so is the age range. They said love is marriage, kindness, it's mercy, appreciation, a choice to give up, to care and sacrifice for others, to do what God did first. So what would you say? What is love? One or two words, two or three words. What is love? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, action. Patience. Patience. Selfless. Selfless. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. A choice. It's a choice. It's gentle. Louder. Seek the highest good of another. Yes. Unconditional. It's unconditional. God is love. Very good. That's the foundational thing that we're after. <laughs> I was going to share that one with everybody. So, but culturally, like, we, we say, I love you all the time. And... Um, we, we have to think about what that means. We're gonna move through some scriptures now. And they're all gonna come up on the board and we're gonna do this kind of fast because I'm already taking too long. Let me give you three things. These are not like the big three points, but let me give you three things that should always be true about love. Number one, love is always relational. It always is a connection, it is relational with someone or some, with, with a person, including God. And then there are two parts of love, I would say. There is, love is action. It's, there is the doing side of love and there is the being side of love. And I think we often think of love as, as an action. Love is a verb. Now, love is also a noun, but when we think about loving someone, we usually think of that as an action. And I would like to suggest that it is also a state of being that is summed up in the word presence. And so we're gonna look at a bunch of scripture now and define love through God's character because God said multiple times in scripture, primarily in 1 John 4, God is love. So if God is love, then we need to define love through who God is, right? Now, what's not true is love is God. That is a false statement. God is love is a true statement. It's in the Bible. It's very clear. Love is not our God. We could get very confused on that very fast. But God is love. And that means when we want to know what love is, we've got to look at who God is. So we're going to blitz through some scripture here and see how we can define love through who God is. So let's look at Genesis chapter two. 
And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. Can you, but of the tree, let me just, well, I don't have that one here. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now that does not say love, that verse. God plants this amazing garden. He creates and does this wonderful, amazing act of creation. And he makes man and woman, and then he plants this tree. Well, he planted the tree first, then he created Adam. Then he tells Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, why is that love? Because love is a choice. Without that tree, for man to be able to decide, I'm gonna trust you, God, or I'm not gonna trust you. I'm gonna believe you, or I'm not gonna believe you. There is no such thing as love. Love cannot exist when you don't have a choice. It, you're a robot. But God did not make robots. He made us. And he gave us this sovereign will to love him or hate him. So that's love. Next, we have Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. So we have God the, the doing love of God, the active love of God, and where his faithfulness endures to every generation. And we also have the being love of God, that he has this steadfast love toward us no matter what. Psalm 103, verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So God has this love that is so massive. And then he takes and removes our sin far from us. And we'll see when we hit the New Testament how he did that. But his love is bigger. It's beyond the scope of your ability to sin. His love is always more than you can possibly do to push him away. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. This is such an important side of God's love. He disciplines the son that he loves. Now, I wanna point out something for parents and for anybody who's in the in the journey of discipline. Discipline and punishment are different. Punishment was all soaked up at the cross. All of it. We don't need to be punished anymore. And neither do our children and neither do whoever we're working with or walking with, our disciples. We need to be disciplined. Discipline is to be drawn into what is right. It's to be narrowed into the, the, the ways and means of God. And God disciplines us as a form of his love. So if you are in a painful season, I am not saying, I'm not throwing shame on you. I'm not telling you you're walking in sin. I am saying it's a good question to ask. Lord, is this pain your discipline? I don't know your story and I do not wanna heap anything on you that's not from Jesus. But I will say that his discipline becomes increasingly severe as we disobey and don't listen. It must, because a, a good father will discipline his son well and his daughter well, and will say, that's not the right way, come this way. That's not the right way, come this way. You're not listening to me, I need you to come this way because this is the path of life that I've promised for you. Next, Hosea 3, 1. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who's loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin. I'm not sure if cakes of raisin are enticing to you or not, <laughs> but I am sure that you have been unfaithful at times to Jesus. And I'm very sure, I used to think that 
Israel and the disciples, they're all a bunch of idiots because they are, but I realize the older I get that I'm just like them. And God has done so many good things that it doesn't make a bit of sense that I would ever walk away from him or be unfaithful. But I am. But this is who God is. That he tells the prophet, go chase Go chase a harlot. Go chase a prostitute and bring her back and say, I love you still. I love you still. How many times did he have to do that? Just so God could express his faithful love to his people. Jonah 3, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way, he relented of the disaster that uh, he was planning for them. Sorry, I didn't give them the right one on that. And he didn't do it. The Ninevites, an evil people, relented. They, they believed him. They heard the prophet Jonah. They turned from their way and God said, okay, mercy to you. He gave his love. He's always ready to give his love. Isaiah 43, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God said, I'm yours. I'm with you. I'm present. I will help you. Not only is he actively helping you, but he is present with you. Can we skip to Nehemiah, guys? There's a couple of scriptures down. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. How many times do we want to return to our slavery? But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. How does God love you with a love that abounds, that is gracious and merciful and slow to anger? That's how God loves you. So let's look at the New Testament a little bit. John three sixteen. Come on, people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's our God. He loved the world so much that he gave everything he could give that whoever believes in Jesus would not perish, but have eternal life. Not only does our God's love provide for our desperate need, but it provides lavishly that we would have eternal life with him. Now, I asked my family this question, what is love? My parents gave very serious answers. We got really beautiful, childlike answers from the kids. My sister, uh, who said, she answered in our little chat group, she said, actually, when we were about to get married 20 years ago, mom said, this is what love is. Love takes the initiative to act sacrificially to meet the need of another. I was like, wow, you remember that from 20 years ago. So then my mom pipes into the chat and she says, actually, I heard that. I just want you to know where that came from so I don't take credit for it. We were at family camp at this place called Prescott Pines. I grew up in Arizona. And, and this is like 35 years ago. And my mom says, this guy preached on John three sixteen, And I've, I've believed this. I've understood what love is ever since. Love takes the initiative to act sacrificially to meet the need of another. 35 years, she's been carrying that def definition around in her pocket. Love takes the initiative to act sacrificially to meet the need of another. Um, John 15, 13. We're gonna skip around a little, guys, sorry. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now, I wanna say it's really important what we're listening to. Again, the word of God right here. This is what we should listen to. I was listening to a Bethel song. I love Bethel. I listen to their music. I'm not bashing Bethel. It's just where the song came from. It's called Extravagant. 
And in this song, it says, it says something to the effect of, we'll never know how far God will go to show us how, what his, his love is. And I wanna tell you that is not true. The fullness of God's love is on display in the cross of Jesus. There is nothing else. There will be no surprises when we get to heaven. We will see a sacrificial lamb and a, and a risen king. And there's not gonna be any like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you did that for me. It's all right there in Jesus. And so to think, again, it's just a slight little thing that we need to filter through what God says in his word. I understand what they're trying to say because he's continuing to love us and he's continuing to show us that in a variety of ways individually. But the fullness of that love is, is evident in Jesus and in the scriptures. There's nothing new about it. And so we have to be careful what we're taking in. I wanna remind you, God loves you. And he loves you in so many different ways through who he is. So how do you know that he loves you? That's the question. Like, how does this land in your heart? How do you live in that truth? And I'm gonna give you the secret. It's not really a secret. The word is faith. The way to, there's all this God of love. There's all of what he is and who he is and what he's like and his love and all that stuff. We touched on a tiny bit of scripture that shows us who, who God is in love. And the way into that love is faith. It's believing that that good loving God is for you. And so we're gonna read a story real quick real quick, of a woman who believed that God truly loved her. So Luke chapter seven, here's the story. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said, very important to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. Can you put yourself in this story? You've got Simon the Pharisee who's like built up all this religious stuff to, to tell people how God will love them or not love them if they respond or don't respond to the rules and traditions. And then you have this woman who is a, who is a wreck. She's ugly crying on the feet of Jesus. She is wetting his feet with her tears. She is wiping. These are not clean feet. Jesus has not even at this point turned around to look at her. And she has cleaned his feet. with her tears and her hair. And Simon, the Pharisee thinks, oh, if he only knew, he's clearly not a prophet, if he only knew what kind of woman was standing behind him. Her label was a sinner. What that tells you is, he did not think of himself as a sinner. So verse 40, Jesus answered, Jesus answered. He answered a man who th had a thought it says, and Simon thought to himself, I can't believe this. And Jesus answered him saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Simon answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two, two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Now I can imagine Simon the Pharisee's thinking, 
Yes, I did judge rightly. <laughs> Simon is not yet thinking, this man read my thoughts. And I'm not sure if he ever gets to that point. But what we see is we see that Jesus knows his thoughts and he asks this question and teaches him something. And then we get to verse 44. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Jesus facing Simon at the table, turns to the woman and looks at her, but he is speaking to Simon behind him. He says, do you, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Remember the little story he said, which of these two men will love this man more? And he said, well, the one whose debt's the more, the, the one who had more debt. And Jesus said, of course, you're right. And this woman has sat at my feet and because of her love for me, I'm telling you that her sins are forgiven. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, finally, he's talking to the woman who he's been looking at now as he's telling Simon these things. Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Because she knew she needed great forgiveness, she poured, everything out for Jesus. It was because of her recognition of her deep need and his love meeting that need that she could pour her heart out to him in such an embarrassing way. Simon, on the other hand, is busy worried about some other person's sin. Jesus, in the middle of all of this, don't, don't you see his subtle love and pursuit of Simon? Simon says, surely this guy, he can't be a prophet. He doesn't know who's standing behind him. And then he reads the man's thoughts. And if Simon realized he would say, surely he is a prophet. I need to throw myself at his feet. Jesus continues to pursue this guy. It's wild. And the difference between Simon and the woman is one word, faith. And that's what I want to submit to you. God wants you to know that he loves you right now. And he wants you to understand what that means and what it looks like. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you just like you are. And he will change whatever needs to be changed in you. He loves you right now. And the way we enter into that love is by faith. And we receive his love by faith. It's the only way. But we have to believe that this massive love that God has is for us. And so my question to you is what part of God's love do you need right now? Are you dealing with loss? You need presence. Are you dealing with some sin? You need forgiveness. Are you ready to repent? He will bring mercy. Do you not know what to do or where to go? He will bring you love in leading you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. So I just wanna to submit to you, begin to surrender right now to this loving God. And what we're gonna do now as the team starts to, to 
we're gonna have a, a song of worship is that I wanna offer you an act of faith. And the act of faith would be, you can sit in your seat or you can come down here and that your faith would say, God, I receive your love where I need it. So wherever you feel that sense of God, I need your love, I need your love. You can sit there and think that you need it and not believe and receive it all you want. But I would just exhort you to say, God, I know your love is for me. I'm gonna be like that woman and I'm gonna receive everything that you have for me. We have to believe God for who he says he is. And we want to believe that his word is true. So if you have a need to receive God's love, then you can come here and the prayer team, if you want, you can come pray over people. Here's what I would ask you to pray. Pray the love of God. Pray the character of God over people this morning.